Hello, and thanks for tuning in to another Fisher Investments Market Insights podcast, where we discuss our firm's latest thinking on global capital markets and current events. My name is Naj Srinivas. I'm the Group Vice President of Client Communications here at the firm. And today I have returning to the podcast, a senior research analyst at Fisher Investments, Scott Botterman. Thanks for having me, Naj. So Scott, you, like myself, travel all around the country, all around the world, actually, meeting with our private clients and our institutional clients, presenting in front of them and answering some questions that they have. And on today's podcast, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some questions that we've been receiving pretty frequently from from clients, both on the institutional side and our private client side. So Scott, what are some of the themes or questions you've been hearing lately? You know, a lot of the questions we're getting this year are residuals from ones last year. I mean, really over the last 12 months, the questions have been focused on trade war fears, uh, Chinese economic weakness, Fed interest rate hikes. Those have been pretty consistent. I think the thing that's changed a little bit is you're starting to get those global growth slowdown fears um, that really bubbled up in December. Um, But overall, we kind of believe that many of those are, are false fears and that the environment that we're in is a lot better than people expect. So let's take each one of those that you just described, unpack them a little bit, but then also we'll talk about some of the things that maybe people are missing despite all of these fears, those positive fundamentals out in the world. So let's talk about trade war. A trade war has seemingly been discussed since 2016. And we still haven't really seen the implications of that. So what implications are there, if any, and how does that impact capital markets more broadly? Well, if you look at the actual impact that the announced tariffs and even some of the what the escalation of those would be, it's a small slice of overall global GDP growth. So it's not enough to really derail the economic expansion. And... If you think about global trade, if you have two countries that are involved in trade and they increase tensions more or less and and create restrictions, companies are just going to shift around their supply chains. Now, we're not saying it's going to be completely without some sort of friction and some sort of detraction. They're, They're obviously not a positive, but you've already started to see companies shift their supply chains. If you're a U.S. manufacturing firm, most, time, most of the cases, you actually haven't been opening up that second factory or third factory in China. You've been opening it up in Mexico or in Vietnam, where you have just the skilled labor able to do the same things that you've been doing in China at a lower cost. I mean, China is no longer the low cost to produce country when it comes to labor. And so you've already seen that, that shift. Now, there's still a lot of production in China. So again, there's going to be some headwinds there. But it's not going to be as impactful as many people fear. Um, And, you know, I think that there's been this belief that China's economic weakness has been entirely tied to trade war. And that's something that, you know, we we disagree with. We actually think there's greater headwinds for China's economy last year um, that were tied to shadow banking. And that this year they've gone through and taken some steps to address that. So you'll probably see a little bit more stability in economic activity out of China in 2019 than you saw last year. So let's go back to scaling global tariffs relative to the world economy. Can you help scale that for our listeners a little bit? I mean, if you think about what percent of global growth there is, you're talking roughly around like $200 billion. And if you think about how much growth you get, and think last year it was close to around $5.5 trillion, that's not enough. On, to, on a world economy, a world that's about economy, $80 right. trillion. Dollars. Right. So, I mean, if you think about it from a percent standpoint... It's a small sliver. And there are a lot of times where you have headwinds that could be a small sliver from growth, but you'd have to have a lot of them in order to offset that. And it's just not enough. And I think that that's what people miss is that there's that fear that it's going to escalate further. And we've taken that into account. And even if you do that, it's not enough. So you mentioned China a moment ago, and I want to go back to that as well. One of the fears that's pretty common out there is that China is going to have a hard economic landing. And that actually ties back to one of the fears, the common fears that many clients are asking about us about today, which is this global economic slowdown or the purported global economic slowdown. So what's actually been happening in China and how does that impact the global economy, specifically global growth? I mean, China is the second largest economy in the world and has a very large contribution to growth. I mean, if you think about Chinese growth, as you've seen, it's gone from 
double digit uh, growth rates on an annual basis now down to around 6.5 to 6.3%. And so you have seen a pretty significant deceleration in growth, but that's to be expected. When you get to the size that China's economy is, there's going to be a natural movement towards slower growth. You just can't sustain that over long periods of time. Um, so what does that mean for the global economy? Well, it means certain areas that where China was growing a little bit faster, those that slow more, um, are going to be more negatively impacted. If you think about what China focused on for the last 20 years, um, they've been a big focus on infrastructure and industrial manufacturing. That part of the economy is growing much more slowly than other parts like the consumer in China. And so the Think about the global economy, the ones that are positioned in order to fuel that older portion of the Chinese economy, they're going to face some headwinds, but that's going to be offset by stronger growth within the consumer space. And I think what people still forget that is China, it's not going to be just a smooth progression. There's going to be years where it decelerates more. There's going to be years where it decelerates less, but it's still growing. And I think that's the thing that most people miss is there's still a significant amount of growth occurring in that economy. Now, last year was a disappointing year for Chinese economic activity. Most economic data surprised the downside. Um, and it was very easy for people to make an excuse for the Chinese economy and because they're saying, well, it was the trade war. But in fact, most of the pain that was inflicted in the Chinese economy was self-inflicted by the government. Uh, shadow banking has been a sore spot for the Chinese government. Basically what shadow banking is, is lending outside of the traditional banking system. So what happened was over time, China's banks are heavily regulated and they limit who can get money. So certain organizations found way to lend out money to people who weren't viewed as credit worthy from state run banks. And so new debt was created through these institutions and quite a bit of it. Chinese government doesn't like that because then you're creating the potential for a bubble outside of their typical control. And it really started to peak in late 2016 and 2017. And so they said that they were going to start to unwind that and increase regulations and move those assets back onto balance sheets, which essentially implies they're going to deleverage. So if you think about a credit system, most of it's driven by loan growth. Well, now you're having that deleveraging, which is going to limit overall credit to the the monetary system. And that's what China went through last year. They aggressively tried to shift these back onto banks' balance sheets and remove the growth that had been a big component of Chinese credit system from shadow banking. And so they thought that if they increased traditional loan growth and try to offset some of that that was coming from shadow banking's unwind, it would be enough. But it wasn't last year. They actually found that banks weren't all that willing to lend to the people who were participating in shadow banking. And so throughout the course of the year, they were announcing stimulus more or less in the form of requ required reserve ratio cuts, giving banks additional capacity to lend. But they weren't lending to these companies that had been using shadow banking because why would you? They're less credit worthy. It kind of hurts their balance sheet quality. So the Chinese government being as a uh, pleasant as they are sometimes, told the banks, no, you're going to now lend to these entities. And so you're now starting to see that implemented. But last year, that was a big headwind. If you were to look at indicators like M1, money supply, um, it only tracks basically money supply on corporate balance sheets. And that went from a usual growth rate in the high single digits to teens to one and a half percent in December and decelerated massively. So you had a liquidity crunch in the corporate sector. I mean, just think about what the liquidity crunch can do to an economy. And while there's a shift towards consumption in China, there's still a big uh, old industrial component to their economy that was facing that significant headwind. And so we think that's actually what contributed more. And it was more of almost a monetary policy misstep by the Chinese government that led to some of the weakness. So, I mean, if lending is the oil in the engine of an economy, basically what China's been trying to do is give itself an oil change. In, in, a, in a big way, yes. And, and with that, you kind of have to take the car off the road for a bit, right? I mean, think of it as kind of a pit stop. And, and I think what's important to note is it's not like this is the first time this has occurred. China's had a few periods of economic slowness just in this current global 
expansion. I mean, go back to 2008, 2009, that was a period where obviously every region was negatively impacted and China announced a massive amount of stimulus, including accelerating loan growth, uh, stimulus in the form of infrastructure spending. 2011 and 12, their economy slowed and they announced another mini stimulus. 2015 and 16, same thing. You had a period of economic slowness, they announced stimulus. And they're doing the same thing now. And right now, the announced stimulus is close to about 5% of GDP for China. And so it's pretty sizable, and that's almost up to the same scale as we saw in 2015, 16. So it seems like you kind of go a couple years with decent growth, then one year where things slow down a little bit more. And we kind of think where we went through that period last year, and you're, you'll see an acceleration next year, or this year. So let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about our good friend Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve. One of the big fears that we've had recently is rate hikes. It seems like the news media and the investors broadly are just continue to be hyper focused on what the Fed is saying. What color tie is Jerome Powell wearing today? Does that mean he's hawkish or dovish? What are the dot charts on future Fed interest rate hike probabilities look like? Um, so there's just all this consternation about Fed rate hikes. What's been our take on that? Well, I mean, what we kind of look at as a good indicator is is the yield curve. And if you look at spreads between the three-month Treasury and 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, that gives you kind of a ind- good indication for the health of the economy um, because banks more or less borrow at the short end of that yield curve and lend out at the long end. And so if you see an overly aggressive Fed that raises short interest rates, and they're the ones that really control that above long rates, that can be pretty problematic for the economy. And of course, the marketplace is more in control of longer term rates. Than right. It's going to be driven more by supply and demand dynamics and mm-hmm. also by expectations of inflation. And so if they're overly aggressive, that can be problematic for an economy. But it's also not that uncommon to see a yield curve flatten at this point in the economic expansion. And if you look back into the 1990s and you look back into especially the late 1990s, the yield curve looks pretty much exactly the same as it does today. Um, not Still have about a 40, 50 basis point spread between short rates and long rates, and that can persist for several years. So I think what we're looking for is if they were to continue to raise and ignore that, that would be problematic. But it seems like they are aware of that. In fact, they've talked about the yield curve. Uh, last year, there were a few times where people started talking about yield curve inversions. And they were looking at kind of more esoteric versions of it. like Between the two-year and the five-year, for example. Exactly. Or they were looking at things like the LIBOR-linked uh, short-term interest rate and the long rate. And the Fed actually came out and made a statement and said, no, the yield curve is the three-month and the 10-year. And that is actually a better indicator for economic sensitivity than these other factors that people are prognosticating on. And so... It is something that they're aware of. And as you started to see the economy slow, and and the U.S. economy did slow in the last quarter of of 2018, they took a step back. So that was a good sign to us. If if they're at least acknowledging what's going on, that's a positive. Now, if they were to ignore it and continue to go through, you know, a risk for the market is a monetary policy mistake. But we don't think we're there yet. And there's actually a little bit more room for them to tighten than before things were to get very serious. And even if you invert the yield curve, it doesn't mean you immediately fall into recession. There's some time after that. So uh, it just seems like people are being overly reactive and overly sensitive to it. And as you said, just like reading into every single word. And it's not actually just the Fed that they're doing that. It's the ECB. It's the Chinese Central Bank, the Bank of Japan. Everyone is just hyper-focused on verbiage. I mean, it, it may be that they have a change in monetary policy, or it may just mean that they discovered a thesaurus. <laughs> And, and of course, just because they announce something or they project they're going to do something in the future, they're not obligated to do that. I mean, they are taking a look at conditions and they are adjusting based on the conditions they're seeing in the future or what they expect to happen in the future. Exactly. I mean, you think back to this Fed and what they've said that they're targeting, what they're looking at for a long time is unemployment. If unemployment gets to this level, then we're going to have to make some changes. And then we hit that. And they're like, well, it's actually wage growth that we're going to focus on. And then it's like, oh, well, there's some other things that we want to take into account. It, it's a constant moving target. And they're, they're humans. They're going to change their minds. And you, know, you have to be aware of it in case it does have some implications. But oftentimes, it takes a lot longer for those 
to impact the economy and impact the market in a material way. Um, so I think the market has just been hyperly sensitive to it. And, and again, I think it's just a false fear that the market's had for quite some time. So we're sitting here February 1st, and the government has come into a short-term budget agreement that funds the government for a couple of weeks, effectively. And we're going to end up back sort of right back where we started before too long with Republicans and Democrats trying to negotiate and hammer out a budget that President Trump will, in fact, sign. What have been some of the economic and market impacts of the government shutdown that we just ended, well, the longest in history, in fact? And looking forward, how do we see kind of this continuing debate if we don't get a long-term budget, which we haven't had for some time, impacting capital markets looking ahead? It, it, you've seen quite a few estimates come out in terms of what the economic impact will be. Um, I think it was the, the Senate Budgetary Committee came out and said that there was uh, an impact in somewhere in the, the, the high single digits and billions. So somewhere between six to eight billion was lost in the shutdown that was permanently lost, which again, it's hard to really measure that activity level. So it's, it's a, a guesstimate. If you think back again to that scaling we did for tariffs, and you think about a couple hundred billion, you take the six to eight billion that occurred, obviously not a positive, but it's not much of a negative from an economic standpoint. You think about how markets have reacted historically through government shutdown, they haven't really reacted at all. Um, doesn't really have a big impact on them. They've been positive the majority of the time. And it's just because it's an incremental negative and it's not enough to really cause major problems to the global economy. Um, so maybe the government shuts down again and it can be frustrating. The human impact is, is far worse than the economic and market effect. I mean, the people who are impacted by not getting their wages, that's probably the, the biggest problem that comes from it. But from a market and, and an economic standpoint, the effect is minimal. Um, and I think some of it's because you think about the activity, some of these contracts that have, well, they might not work this week. But if they work the next week when the government's back open, they'll make up the time that they lost. And so it just pushes out that growth a few weeks out. Um, so it's, it's, again, not as big a negative as people believe. And there's a fair argument to be made, in fact, that a government shutdown actually fosters gridlock, which, as we've discussed on this podcast and in other places many times before, we believe that political gridlock is actually pretty good for stocks. Political gridlock maintains the status quo and allows investors to really understand what's going on in the marketplace. Now, if you think about gridlock and why it is positive and, and why we talk about it, it's because it lowers the amount of uncertainty. I mean, if you think about what creates uncertainty, new legislation always does. Um, you know, just think about a new piece of legislation that comes through. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages of new regulations that are oftentimes associated with that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of these aren't even written when they're passed. You think back to things like Dodd-Frank or the affordable health care, those things were phased in over a number of years. If you're running a business that's impacted by these measures, it creates a high degree of uncertainty in terms of what do you do from an investment standpoint? How can you deploy this? When is this going to impact? What is going to be the total headwind or tailwind that it creates for my operations? Because whenever you pass legislation, you create winners and losers, and with that, uncertainty. So when you get that gridlocked environment, it makes everyone a little bit more comfortable in terms of being able to execute on capital expenditures, to go through and have comfort in what their operations are going to look like. And from that standpoint, that's good for stocks because again, you don't have winners or losers that are being created by new legislation being passed. So if you're afraid of a certain policy that's been proposed, whether it's from the Republicans or the Democrats, the likelihood in this current political environment that it makes it through and is approved is very, very low, which again is what we believe would be a positive. Well, Scott, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for joining us. No, it's my pleasure. And for all of you listening, thanks for tuning in. If you have feedback on this podcast or ideas for other topics you'd like to hear us talk about, please email us. Our email address is marketinsights, all one word, at fi.com. We'd love to hear from you. And for more, please visit marketminder.com. Thanks again for tuning in. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. Past performance is no guarantee of future returns.
The content of this podcast represents the opinions and viewpoints of Fisher Investments and should not be regarded as personal investment advice. No assurances are made we will continue to hold these views, which may change at any time based on new information, analysis, or reconsideration. Copyright Fisher Investments 2019.